at Britain's Supreme Cat Show, the celebrities are groomed for stardom. Even the cages are dressed up. Nowhere does adoration of the domestic cat reach such dizzy heights as in the show ring. Cat shows are a serious business. They're feline beauty contests and not to everyone's taste. The real success of the cat is not on the show bench. It's in our homes, where the dog may soon be pushed out of its long-held place as most popular pet by Britain's seven million cats. In the United States, the cat is already number one. With 55 million, it's the biggest cat-owning society in the world. In both countries, cat ownership has soared by 30% in the last 10 years. <laughs> the cat is said to become the most popular pet in the world. Anchor real dairy cream and half fat anchor half cream are frightfully popular. On both sides of the Atlantic, that popularity has become a marketing dream. Here, the cat really has taken over. Ever since Arthur started eating cat meat on television, he's become quite a tourist attraction. Ah, here's another coach load now. All right, everyone. Cat food commercials turn cats into stars from the very beginning. When it comes to food, cats have an impressive brand loyalty, and that's a gift to manufacturers in persuading owners what's best for their pets. Never tasted so good. And furthermore, cat meat is now being served in the refreshment tent. You know, sometimes Arthur thinks that's the only reason they come. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your quarter hour call. You have quarter now. Thank you. The cult of the cat is such that Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical Cats, based on the poems of T.S. Eliot, has become the longest continuous running musical in London. It's now in production all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your five minute call. You have five minutes. Thank you. I know. Yeah, don't have to. Elliot had become familiar with the groups of black and white feral cats that lived around the squares and streets of central London. He called them Jellicle cats, and their meeting places became the scene of the Jellicle Ball. And, um, well, I'll see you at the Jellicle Ball then. Cat's modern popularity owes much to Harrison Weir, the man who in 1871 invented cat shows. Cat shows became an instant success, but Weir soon resigned as president of the National Cat Club, complaining that the prizes had become more important than the cat's welfare. Please don't treat him so. He was out last night 
it's true. But he likes the cuddle just the same as you. So don't do that to the poor puss cat. No, 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 no. Cat breeding produced undeniably beautiful animals, but also some changes. The silky Angora became the fluffy Persian with its flatter face and nose. This stuffed cat was called Trilly. It lived at the war office at the turn of the century. And when it died, it was brought here to the vaults of the Natural History Museum in London, where it's been ever since. Now, cats like Trilly are very useful because they give us valuable evidence that in the early days of cat shows, Persians had good, long noses. But today, things are very different. This peak-faced Persian at an American show has an almost flat nose. The cat's buckled tear ducts cause the eyes to continually overflow and it has breathing difficulties. In Britain, we consider this is breeding taken too far, but in America, it often wins top honors. Many other Persian-type cats have a similar appearance. Unfortunately, showing can lead to extremes. Just because a breeding standard specifies a short nose, it shouldn't be a case of the shortest winning. After centuries of independence, these cats need combing every day. We're breeding for dependency, selecting kittenish, flatter faces, surrogate children who will never grow up. Are you helping me? He likes to help. We're in danger of turning cats into toys. The ancient Siamese has also changed. When they first arrived as gifts from the King of Siam in the late 19th century, they were quite chunky. Yet compared to British moggies, they were thought sinuous and slender, as well as exotically marked. By the 1930s, they'd become established as the most popular short hair show cats in Britain. But in the last 30 years, this oriental cat was deemed not oriental enough. Breeders began moving away from the original build by selecting much thinner cats. Here in the United States too, the Siamese was the most popular short hair show cat. And yet over the last few years, the unthinkable has happened. They've all but disappeared from the American show bench. So what's gone wrong? The search for a dainty cat has led to a frail animal with inevitable health and breeding problems. For me, this is one of the saddest stories in the history of cat breeding. Where once there were scores of Siamese at major American shows, now there are only one or two. The cat's welfare was sacrificed for the sake of fashion. In the most affluent cat-owning country in the world, novelty is what counts not the cost. The bottom line, though, is it's the most fun you'll ever have with your cat. One-on-one, -on -one, the games that you'll make up with your cat are just on and on and on. Cat number 443 needed in ring nine. Cats from breeders are becoming a larger part of the population as most pet animals are now neutered. And as fashions change, so do the cats. This cat weigh? 22 pounds. 22 pounds. <laughs> He's, uh... Half plain points, I mean, he's half Persian. Oh, he's about as big as him. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's much bigger than my dog, I'll tell you that. <laughs> In America particularly, there's been a trend since the 1950s towards weirdness. such a good boy. This is the Scottish Fold, a mutation not accepted in Britain, but recognized in the United States. Its ears are deformed flat against its head. In the American curl, the ears are bent permanently backwards. In Britain in 1950, the Cornish Rex was taken up for the novelty value of its crimped coat. But it must be kept away from cold weather. 
it was followed in 1960 by the Devon Rex. Even its whiskers are crimped. This is a Selkirk Rex. The coat is the most fantastic thing you've ever touched. It's curly, but it's long hair. A brand new Rex with curly long hair. For many, a more acceptable coat change. But this is also a cat. It's the Sphinx. Totally naked, no fur, no whiskers, and it must be kept warm. Sphinx male, 11 months old, showing good development. Absolute hairlessness, good bone structure, good stop at the face, nice wrinkling, absolute hairlessness, very nice. Nice to some, but that such an abnormal animal is bred at all deeply offends many people. What is it? This is a munchkin. But what's a munchkin? They're the little people of the cat world. They have short legs, they're built very much like a dachshund and a, or a corgi. And there's good evidence that this may be the same gene that we actually are seeing in the shorter leg breeds of dogs. The dog fancy and people who have had dogs accept a wide range of variation, whereas in cats, we bred within relatively short confines. We change ears, we change tails, we change the coat. But this is a very radical departure from what we would expect a cat to look like. The munchkin is the most startling physical change so far. This stumpy-legged cat can neither jump nor run with the same dexterity as other cats. Breeders are also changing the cat's behavior. The rag doll was developed in California by Ann Baker. It gained its name by going limp when handled. You see, the cats are not what they look like. Their temperament and disposition. You see this here? Sure put up a lot. Yeah. Now you catch, see? Okay. All right. Hi there. They're good around children and... Oh, yeah. See, children can do anything with it. They can dress it up in doll clothes, take it for a ride in a buggy and all that kind of stuff. Now, one is like this the ultimate docile cat, a cushion like cat? Are we in danger of losing the spirit of the cat in exchange for a soft living toy? Here, I'm going to throw him back to you and see if he reacts the same way to you, okay? Oh, <laughs> there, see? See what a pretty kitty he is? They sure put up a lot. Yeah. The story of the dog offers a warning for the cat's future. Working dogs were always selected for fitness. But when selection was just for show, appearance without function, it led to genetic disasters. Today's bulldogs, with their huge short heads, have breathing and breeding difficulties. The bloodhound show standard demands loose skin to pull down the eyelids, but that inflames the eyes and causes infections. The basset hound's tendency to arthritis in its stubby legs casts a shadow on the outlook for the munchkin. Come on there, Bosco. Come on. Come on, Pinky. Come on, Bosco. Come on. Come on. It's hard to believe, but this huge Great Dane and this tiny little scrap of a Chihuahua have the wolf as their common ancestor. But dogs have always been far more controlled by man than cats and used as working animals for a wide variety of tasks. So when a mutation occurred, producing a new shape or size, mankind readily exploited it. There hasn't been that same close working relationship with cats, so we didn't exploit them to the same extent. Cats as yet haven't changed significantly in size, but that doesn't mean they can't. A pet cat playfully chewing your hand is one thing. A domestic cat the size of a leopard or lion is a different story. And it could happen. So far, only the cat's size has not changed significantly. It may be only a matter of time before this occurs by a mutation or crossbreeding. 
We have Rottweilers as pets, despite a genetic selection for aggression. So who would challenge the inevitable insanity of huge house cats? The cat has successfully managed its own breeding over the thousands of years since domestication. Yet in the brief time under our control, are we in danger of ruining it? This American Bengal has a spotted coat from matings with a wild leopard cat. So crossbreeding to wild cats is not fantasy. It's already happening. Not yet for size, but for the coat of the wild species. The docile behavior of the domestic cat has been retained so far. More controversially, another spotted cat, the California Spangled, was launched by Christmas Catalog. An American store chain advertised them as leopards for your living room. In three days, we have sold nine of the cats through our Dallas operation, and our stores across the country are also taking orders as well. Come here. Come on. This method of promoting pets as status symbols led to much protest. Cats by mail order for $1,400 each. To eat this one. Sure. That's a good girl. Ironically, these so-called designer cats were developed without using any wild cat genes, but to actually ease the pressure on spotted cats in the wild. Their inventor was Hollywood scriptwriter Paul Casey, who bred them normally enough, but their promotion aroused hostility. Okay. People are fanatics, especially the people that show cats. And someone said to me, uh, she, she said, here we were, uh, you know, going along just fine, and all of a sudden, the spangled cat came on <laughs> and blew everybody off. I mean, the first reaction was, you know, like, this this has got to be squashed. It's got to get rid of this. It can't be right. We never heard of it before. You know, this is a farce. This is show business. <laughs> Announcing a surprising new presidential candidate, Morris the Cat. It's time we had a finicky president. As well as changes in breeding, we're also changing the cat's lifestyle. TV commercials help to sell almost $3 billion of cat food a year in the United States. And they've made a feline superstar out of a ginger tom called Morris. They call me a multifaceted feline. Sex symbol, actor, author. Uh, going someplace? Look at you. She's got you spinning your wheel. Morris! Supper time! Nine lives, that's the best reason of all. See you around, sport. Nine lives, I'd run around the world for you. Over the last 10 years, the majority of American cats have become captives, unlike in Britain, where they can still wander outdoors. Inevitably, that's brought problems and work for Dr. Peter Borschelt, a New York cat psychologist. Most people would start a conversation on the phone with something like, I don't believe I'm doing this, I'm embarrassed about calling up an animal behaviorist, or they would say, I can't believe I'm calling a pet shrink. What was the problem that uh, you have with the cat? He's a very, very aggressive biter. Uh, he'll, for no provocation, no reason whatsoever, he'll bite my ankles, bite my hands. He leaps up and bites the back of my arm. Is it just as much biting, or is it scratching and swatting at you? Well, I've had him declawed, mm -hmm. uh, but it was biting even before he was declawed. A cat trapped in an apartment will focus its playfulness and predatory instincts on us. So this owner is having to learn the skills of playing dead, just like real prey. Or if I'm, if I'm reading uh, or writing, mm -hmm. then he gets particularly vicious. Right. The cat is, is, in a sense, seeing your body as a huge toy, available at certain times and predictable places. Um, nice and soft. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's relevant too because the feedback that, I mean, it sounds sort of bizarre in a way, but when the cat is biting your flesh, it mm -hmm. feels real, like a mouse or a yeah, bird that yeah. he, would be, he would be killing. Well, and my pulling away then the, it is as if I were an animal trying to get away from it. Yes, him. yes, precisely. He's, he's absolutely fearless. In fact, uh, a couple weeks ago, he got out the front door, ran down the hall, climbed up a ladder, and bit a painter. 
See? This cat can bite, but it can't scratch, either people or the furniture. For as well as a visit from an animal psychologist, it's been to the vets to be declawed. Hello, kitty. Check you out here. Declawing cats is common practice in the United States, to the horror of British vets. Sounds good. Good. There you go. Not too bad. Now we'll give him some anesthesia in the chamber. He's putting his nose right up into gas coming in. So that's a cooperative kitten. Go to sleep, Kitty. Declawing is not a strong form of nail clipping. Okay. It's an amputation down to the first joint under a general anesthetic. Insists, and I make sure that this is going to be a 100% indoor cat. But there's always the risk that they go outside because what will happen is they head for that tree, jump up, no claws, crash. Any vets in Britain draw the line? They refuse to do it. Well, that's their privilege. Breathing real well. After a lifetime of confinement, it's only when the American cat dies that it leaves home for the local cat cemetery. These are far more common than in Britain and Europe. For in many American cities, it is illegal to bury your pet in the backyard. To some, this may seem a charade, but to others like Lillian and Mitchell Drobaz, it brings real comfort. It's so sad, but you gave us so much love. God bless you. From your for we can feel as much daddy. grief over the loss of a beloved pet as for a relative. Cats do become part of our families. Come visit you often. 
Are you sure we are? Very off. Because we could never forget. Never. There is another way in America to say goodbye to your pet. Or perhaps never to have to say goodbye. These pets are being freeze-dried. They will keep forever. The vacuum chamber slowly vaporizes the ice out of the deep frozen animals. It takes about six months. In Los Angeles, it's a growing business for Keith Hopkins. The pet nowadays is just a member of their family. And when it dies, it's like losing a member of their family. And, and it really is difficult for them to let go. And that's why they haven't freeze dried, is they, they don't have to let go. Uh, they'll put it up on the mantle sometimes. They'll put it in its favorite place. If, they, if the cat likes to sit on the TV, they'll put it on the TV. I just need to touch up the nose and go to the ears a little bit. I've got to put some color in the ears. In California, freeze drying is the ultimate attempt to keep your pet indefinitely and to pretend you've cheated death. If this seems to confirm your opinions about the excesses of this modern consumer society, just remember the millions of cats mummified in ancient Egypt at the birth of the species and how those remains are now unraveling its origins. The freeze dried cats of today are the mummies of the future. So we've turned full circle to mimic the ancient world where the very first cats were worshipped in life and death. Since then, the cat has lived alongside us for three and a half thousand years and yet kept its independence. Could we now be threatening the future of this the ultimate free spirit, the domestic cat?